Greetings, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first Ganga webinar on the topic of spinal tuberculosis, Sir Percival Potts to now. And we have with us uh, none other than Dr. Rajesh Shikran, for who is going to speak to us on this topic. I welcome you, sir, and uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you for this opportunity. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start off with uh, actually congratulating Ashok on the fantastic uh, work he is doing. I think what he has done single-handed for orthopedic education in India is really inspirational. Now, I think to start off with the Ganga webinars, we will start off with a topic which is very relevant to our country, and that's spinal tuberculosis. And I would go down the history lane of what has changed in our concepts and understanding of this disease from the time of Sir Percival Pot to the present stage. Now, we all know that uh, Dr. Sir Percival Pot was the first to describe this in great detail. And apart from his numerous other contributions to the ankle fracture, in 1782, he published this important paper. Remarks on that kind of palsy of the lower limbs, and that was due to spinal involvement of spinal tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis has ruled over the destiny of men through many, many uh, centuries. Now, this is just not only poor people or people from the lower strata of the society that was involved, but it actually went through the entire spectrum of humans. And that was the reason it was called the captain of the men of death. Here you can see leaders of countries, people who had noble laurels, great people of uh, literature, and even Napoleon and Louis XVII of France. I mean, such brilliant people all have been slain by tuberculosis. And although tuberculosis is as old as man himself, you can see here the mummy, which actually is very famous, this picture. But even today, 21 centuries later, pictures like this of children, we see patients like them day in and day out. Now, this is quite unfortunate. And for a long, long time, the treatment of spinal tuberculosis was just only symptomatic because surgery was a great disaster. Often, surgery led to the death of the patient. And that's why Calais in 1930 said, the surgeon who, so far as tuberculosis is concerned, swears to remove the evil from the very root, will only find one result awaiting him, the death of his patient. So for many centuries down memories lane, the treatment was only sanitarium, good food, good air, sunshine, rest, nutrition, and of course, hope with a lot of prayers. What really dramatically changed the whole thing was chemotherapy. Because chemotherapy gave us the winning sword. Just after the invention of all these important drugs, isoniazid, acid, rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and streptomycin, suddenly we had the winning sword and the table tilted against the disease. Uncomplicated spinal tuberculosis became a medical disease because with chemotherapy, there was excellent cure and healing of the disease. We could see here that bone lesions healed excellently well. Without any surgery, you can see that there has been a good bony fusion and the patient has a very good result, all with chemotherapy. Now, this is a dramatic patient. Now, you can see this young child who has got a very large retropharyngeal abscess. Now, there is a spontaneous resolution of this whole disease with complete healing. And a total disappearance of this abscess with no surgery, all the effects of chemotherapy. Here is one more dramatic example of the success story of uh, conservative therapy. Now, here you can see that there is a total destruction of C4 vertebra, a large epidural abscess, which is causing severe spinal cord compression. And most of us would think that a 
definite surgery is required in this case. But this has been treated conservatively by Dr. Shekhar Bojraj. And you can see here that at the end of the treatment with just chemotherapy, there is a normal alignment of the cervical spine, fusion of the vertebra, the abscess has completely been absorbed and the spinal cord diameter is completely restituted. And at the end of one year, you can see an excellent clinical result. So such has been the dramatic improvement with chemotherapy. And in fact, the MRC trials done in Masan in Korea in 1973 and the uh, Pusan in Korea in 1973 and again in Madras in 1978 all showed that ambulatory treatment with rifampicin and isoniazid acid for nine months were found to be superior to six months regimen with radical resection and without any of the complications of a surgical treatment. So this is actually the end result. And the short course chemotherapy for tuberculosis of the spine, which was reported at 10 year follow-up from Madras, conclusively proved that ambulatory chemotherapy achieved favorable status equally as radical surgery. So this was actually very good news. And then that brings to the question, when you can get such a good result like this by chemotherapy, what is the need for an anterior Hong Kong modified surgery? Now, this was the actual main question. But when you look at the MRC trials, you have to be aware that they did not look at what was the end deformity at the end of chemotherapy. And also, patients with neurological deficit were not taken into consideration. Now, we cannot accept it as a good result if the end result is one with gross kyphosis. Now, let us look at this patient. You can see here that there is a multiple level involvement of the thoracolumbar spine in a small child, completely cured by chemotherapy. But it gets on to a very gross deformity, a big collapse, a massive kyphosis. And these type of deformities, as the child grows, you have a high incidence of them doing what is called a buckling collapse and can end up like this. So deformity is something that you really need to look into when you are looking at the end result of your treatment. Because depending upon the level of your treatment, it can end up in gross paralysis or it can result in cardiopulmonary deficit or lower down, it can also give rise to sagittal imbalance and a lot of pain. So we have to look at deformity. Now, apart from the medical reasons, it's cosmetically devastating to people when they have a big deformity. Now, this is what King Richard III told about himself when he had a kyphosis due to deformity. And he said, deformed and living in this wretched world, so unfashionable and ugly that dogs bark at me as I halt at them. Now, that really shows that we have to look carefully on how to prevent deformity. Now, this was a paper which we published in 1987. We looked at all the patients in the Madras study of tuberculosis of the spine who were treated conservatively. You will find that there was a big good correlation of progressively increasing deformity as the initial vertebral body loss was greater and greater. So that showed that if you had a complete loss of body more than 1 to 1.5, it is important that you subject these patients to surgical treatment. Now later, in 2002, we also looked at 387 patients who had a 15-year follow-up of treatment. And we found that 15% of patients treated conservatively ended with deformity of greater than 60 degrees. But this is the most important thing to know. Almost all the patients who had a very poor result, who ended up with gross deformity, were the result of childhood spinal tuberculosis. Now, this is because 
there is a big difference in the progress in deformity between adults and children. You will find here, during the active phase of the disease, both of them behave similarly. There is an increase in deformity over here. This white line is that of the adult and the red line is that of the children. But after the healing phase of the disease, once chemotherapy has cured the disease, over the next many years, there is no change in deformity in the adults. However, the child also has a cure of the disease at this place. The child is no longer having an active infection. But over the period of years, there is a progressive increase in deformity during the entire growth phase. Now, this is not due to activity of the disease, but it is due to biomechanical reasons that the progress of deformity takes place. Here is a perfect example. Now, this is a child, 36 months after cure of the disease. So the disease has been completely cured. You find that the kyphosis is 40 degrees. But although the child did not have any reactivation, at 15 year follow-up, you can see that the child has progressed to a massive deformity of 115 degrees. Now, that is the reason why this child has got a cure of the disease, no activity, but a kyphosis is present, can progress to like this and can end up like that. So we have to understand that there is more to kyphosis progression than just the activity of the disease. The reason is biomechanical forces. Now we know that the growth plates follow a linear negative relationship with increasing stress. So as you have distraction, the growth plate grows more. But if they are subjected to compressive forces, then the progressive, there is a progressive restriction in growth. And this can actually retard the growth. And that is the reason why you get progressive deformity. But when we were analyzing all these cases, we noticed surprisingly a completely different phenomenon was also seen. Now, here is a patient who has got a kyphosis of L2 and L3. You can see that there is a kyphosis. And so, according to huter Waldman law, we should have a progressive kyphosis. But look what is happening. At five years follow-up, you can see that this fusion mass is triangular. At 10 year follow-up, you can see that this fusion mass is showing an increased growth on the anterior side. And at 15 year follow-up, you can see that this fusion mass has almost become a perfect square. It almost looks like a normal body, but larger in size. And the only clue that you have that it is of two bodies is because it has got two pedicles over it. So surprisingly, although there was a kyphosis and there is an increased anterior pressure, there is an accelerated growth in this patient. Here is another example. This was the first time that this was published where it brought to our notice that actually many of the children with spinal tuberculosis actually correct themselves. The second example is here. You can see a triangular fusion mass with 41 degrees of kyphosis being converted to a 20 degree kyphosis because of accelerated growth on the anterior side. Now, this was quite surprising. And we found this differential behavior that led us to publish this important point that childhood spinal tuberculosis is in fact two separate diseases. In the first acute phase, it behaves like an infectious medical disease, which chemotherapy can completely cure. But in the healed phase, during the entire period of growth, spinal deformity it progresses either for the good or for the worse, and it is modulated by biomechanics. So this is very, very important to understand because no child with spinal tuberculosis should be discharged from our care Till the entire period of growth is over. Now the next important question is, why do some children improve and why do some children deteriorate? This is a million dollar question because if we can selectively identify children who will deteriorate, 
then we can selectively subject them for a surgical procedure. And that will be really good so that all the children may not be subjected to a surgical procedure. Now, this was the point of study in this publication, the natural history of post-tubercular kyphosis in children, where we actually looked at 15-year follow-up of children treated conservatively, and we found that 39% of them deteriorated. Surprisingly, 43% of them improved by themselves, and 17% showed no change. So the big question was, can you identify this 39% who deteriorate? So we went back into all the cases where, uh, who showed uh, poor uh, pro progress. And then we found that most of these children who had a progressive collapse had a dislocation of the facets during the progress. Now you can see that anteriorly, there is a problem here. And you can see that the facets dislocate here uh, posteriorly, which actually led to a bicolum uh, dissociation, and then it led on to a buckling collapse. Now, depending upon that, we found that there was three types of progress. Now, in all the patients in whom the facet was intact, there was a healing through and through, and these patients all got better. In patients in whom there was only a minimal anterior loss and there was a disruption of only one facet, there was a point healing over there and we can see the progress. But when there were multiple facets dislocated, then there was a severe collapse and a buckling collapse occurred. Now this is what was reported in 2007 in Corona. Let us see this example a patient in whom this single facet has dislocated. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> you can see that there is a point contact over here. At the point of contact, there is no formation of bone at all, but the posterior column grows and there is a slight increase in deformity. However, if there are more than one or two facets dislocated over here, you can see that the pressure on the anterior column is very high. So you can see that there is a two-facet dislocation over here. Now here you find that this vertebral body, which is totally uninvolved by the disease, after about six or seven years after the healing of the disease, has undergone pressure attrition over here, and 42 degrees kyphosis has become 71 degrees. Now this progress and this destruction of the bone is not due to tuberculosis, but due to a high level of pressure on the anterior column, due to the loss of protective uh, support of the posterior column, because the two facets are dislocated. So we did a biomechanical study and looked at what was happening and what is the biomechanical pressure involvement. Now we know that a pediatric spine resembles a slender column. And slender columns follow Euler's laws of biomechanical forces. Now, if you draw an FEM, and these are the two vertebral bodies which are destroyed, these are the remnants of the vertebral body and the posterior columns when they dislocate, what you get is that at 30 degrees of kyphosis, due to the law of parallelogram of uh, forces, sorry, you will find that. 80% of vertical forces are converted to translational forces. So whatever is being pressed here acts as a retropulsive force. And then you find that this force pushes the remnants of the vertebral body inside the spinal canal. And this remnants later becomes the internal kyphosis. Then because the anterior column is gone and the facets are already dislocated, you get what is called in biomechanical terminology, the death of a column. And then this is similar to what happened to the twin towers. In a long slender column, you just remove a part of it in the middle. Then a massive collapse actually occurs. And this is what happens to the spinal column also 
and what is the result is a buckling collapse. What is the difference between kyphosis and buckling collapse? In kyphosis, the posterior column is intact. In buckling collapse, because the posterior column is gone, then the spine collapses so much that you get a kyphosis of more than 120 to 140 degrees. And the whole of the remaining spine above and below are converted to two large compensatory curves. Now this has a big bearing over here. You can see that such massive kyphosis can happen. And the superior column and the inferior column almost becomes horizontal. Now this horizontalization of the vertebra has many important uh, facets. Now here you can see that there is one vertebra above and one vertebra below. You are seeing almost the transverse section just lying next to each other. Now this gives rise to the crowding of the ribs, what's called the bird's nest appearance, and it can also give rise to severe cardiorespiratory problem. Now this video is not working, but however you can see that this patient was very short of breath even while he was walking a few steps. Now this is a major problem. The second problem with horizontalization of vertebral segments is as you can see here, if you take a cut of the CT scan or an MRI, you can see two vertebral bodies almost kissing each other and lying and a very painful bursa forms over here. The third big problem is that horizontalization leads to overgrowth of the vertebra. Now you know that in humans, the vertebra is more broader than taller because as we grow, the center of gravity of the forces are working on our growth plates and so the vertebras do not grow very tall. Contrastingly, if you see the vertebra of quadrupeds, where the spine is horizontal, you will always find that their vertebra is longer than broader. And this is actually the same thing that happens in the human vertebra when it becomes horizontalized. Now look at this huge kyphosis. You will find that these vertebra which are horizontalized actually have grown much longer than what you will find in a normal human vertebral body. So this leads to an increase in the parallelogram over here. And as the vertebra grows behind, the internal gibbous actually starts pressing on the spinal column. And that is the reason children like him, he had spinal tuberculosis at four years of age completely normal till he was 16 years of age, and then slowly starts becoming paraplegic. So this is got a lot of clinical relevance. So what is the bedside value of the work? Now, the most important uh, result is that facet dislocation is a clinical event that indicates a point of no return after which compression becomes completely detrimental. So it is important that we need to be careful about identifying facet dislocation as soon as it occurs. Yeah. So if it is very important that facet dislocations actually influence the prognosis so much, then it becomes important that we should identify it as soon as it occurs. We described four simple radiological signs. Signs that can be identified in a plain radiograph because plain radiograph is available all over and complex CT and MRI are not available in many places where spinal tuberculosis is common. Now these four signs are these. Now you can look here, the first one is that when you look at carefully the lateral radiograph, you can identify that a facet is dislocated. Now you must look at it carefully because normally we concentrate so much on the anterior column, scarcely we do we look at the posterior column 
and identify a passive dislocation. The second sign is retropulsion. Now here you can see that if you draw a line on the posterior border of the upper normal vertebra and on the posterior border of the lower normal vertebra, you will find that many of the remnants of the body which has been involved is posterior to these lines. So we call the sign as retropulsion sign. The third was lateral sand translation, where you find that in the AP view, that the vertebra are translated. And these can be identified by drawing a line along the pedicles, and you will find that the superior pedicle is completely displaced. The last sign is the toppling over sign, where when you draw a line on the anterior border of the first normal vertebra, you will find that it cuts on the superior normal vertebra above the midpoint of this vertebra. So presence of more than two signs was indicative of a final deformity of more than 60 degrees. But this is not an additive sign. You don't need to, it's not like a score. You'll find that any of these can occur only if the facets are dislocated. So even if you find any one of this sign, it just indicates that a facet has dislocated and you must be very careful in following up this child. And at the earliest sign of an increase in deformity, you must advocate surgery. So the spine address signs will allow avoiding this kind of disaster to occur. Where a child like this will end up like this over a period of 10 to 12 years without any reactivation of the deformity. Now this is a perfect example. A child cured of tuberculosis, but 47 degrees kyphosis, you can see that two vertebral facets are dislocated. And you should not wait over here, but what is most important is that you should operate and then fuse posteriorly so that a buckling collapse will not happen. Now the importance is the value of the spinal twist sign was not limited to post-TB kyphosis alone. I'm just telling it not for tuberculosis, but in your practice, you can find that this sign works for all kinds of kyphosis. Now, this is a patient with congenital kyphosis. You can see that there is a 33 degrees deformity progressing to 51 and then to 104 degrees. Why was there a sudden increase from 51 to 104 degrees? If you look at the scan, you can find that two facets have dislocated over here. Here is a normal facet but you can see there is a dislocation and dislocation over here. And that is the reason why there is an increase in deformity. Another perfect example, <coughs> this is a congenital kyphosis. You can see that there is a fusion mass anteriorly, but posteriorly, the facet is dislocating over here. Now, this is a danger sign. And here you find that from 28 degrees, it has gone on to 56 degrees, and then there is a massive deformity. And then you can find here there is a sudden increase in deformity because these facets are dislocated. So everywhere in a growing child, whether it is due to congenital kyphosis or due to spinal tuberculosis, you have to look at the posterior column as carefully or more carefully than what you will look at an anterior column. So the learning point from all this is that no child with spinal tuberculosis must be discharged from care till the growth is over. The, the normal sequence of events for us is that suppose we get a child at four years of age or six years of age, we give them chemotherapy for nine to 12 months, follow them up for one to two years, and if there is no symptom, we discharge them. But we have to be careful because there are two types of progress for these. All these children are completely cured of tuberculosis over here. But these children can remain static for kyphosis for many four or five years, and then suddenly show an increase in kyphosis during the growth spurt. So the dictum is never discharge a child from your care till the growth is over. You have to counsel the patients regarding this. Now the second important point is what is neurology and should we operate and does surgery help recovery of neurology? 
Now, this is a big question mark because there is no randomized trial which is really good all over this period of time. Now, we know that neurological involvement can occur early because this can be due to a cold abscess or a compression due to caseous material, sequestrum or disc. But very importantly, in all these children, you need to look at the presence of instability. Instability can actually give rise to a translation and this is one of the very important causes for a sudden onset of neurological deficit. So whenever you find a patient with spinal tuberculosis with a rapid onset of neurology, patient completely normal but getting into pain and getting into a neurology within 24 hours or 48 hours or within a few days, you need to be careful that there is no instability which is causing a yeah, translation and compression of the spine. Or of course, it can be a combination for all of this. And in the late onset disease, where patients get a problem many years after the cure of the disease, you can see here, it can be either due to reactivation of the disease, and that should be at the top of the mind all the time in any late onset, or it can be due to a stretch of the cord due to progressive kyphosis. Now, if you have an MRI like this, where the anterior part does not show a complete fusion, you can see that there is a pseudarthrosis over here. These are the patients who progress in kyphosis and progress in kyphosis, stretch of the cord, along with this instability, gives rise to a neurological deficit. However, there has been no important randomized or large sample studies on this important subject. And that is a problem because there are either people who try conservative treatment or people who operate immediately, but there has been no randomized trial and it is very difficult to get an ethical clearance for a randomized trial on this important subject. But there are papers now recently which have shown that there are better results with surgery whenever the patients come with neurological deficit. So after 2004, you will find that patients in many of the literature undergoing more instrumented surgeries, especially circumferential fusion. And there are reports which say that improvement in paraplegia is better when this is done. For example, the same case that we discussed before, you can see patient came to us with neurological deficit. There is a large internal kippers which is pressing on the cord. You can see the cord is over here and getting very much stretched out. And there is also an instability. What needs to be done is to excise the internal kippers and then fuse anteriorly. All this, the whole part of it has been done from posterior side and the patient recovered. Now, so much for chemotherapy, deformity, and uh, neurological deficit. What are the new concepts regarding surgery? Now, first of all, one of the fundamental things that we should understand, especially for younger surgeons, is that what made surgery so eminently safe in the present time is not surgical techniques, but it is actually chemotherapy. Now, this I told before in 1930, Callas said that if you do surgery, the only end result is death of the patient. But now, chemotherapy has made surgery so safe. So, in every surgical patient, we need to be very careful to emphasize that the patient must be very compliant for chemotherapy. Otherwise, you might have done the perfect of the procedures but you will find that there is a recurrence or some complication if the patient does not go through the full course of surgery. Now, the initial attempts at surgery was before the uh, availability of chemotherapy was uh, on the posterior side because 95% of the lesions were anterior. People were worried to go anteriorly because there may be a uh, continuous uh, sinus. So Albi and Hibbs actually brought about this uh, technique where they did not touch anteriorly, they just went posteriorly. 
and then they created a fusion and that prevented the kyphosis and over a period of time the tuberculosis became better but once there was chemotherapy the dictum that anterior pathology must be approached anteriorly took the uphold and that was why there was a spate of anterior procedures and the two kings of this procedure is naturally Hodgson and Stock. And these two Hong Kong surgeons, they developed anterior approaches to various regions of the spine. And this was for the treatment of spinal tuberculosis. And this started the era of anterior spine surgery. Now, this is what is called the modified Hong Kong surgery. Where you go anteriorly, you do a thorough debridement remove the bone till there is healthy healy, healing normal bone and then the deficit is made all right either by a rib graft or a fibular graft or a iliac crest graft and this was called the modified Hong Kong surgery. Now the only problem with this surgery and what you can see in their initial report is that this surgery was associated with high level of morbidity and mortality. In the first 104 patients that they described, you can see that there was a mortality of 4% due to surgical complications, not due to the disease, but as a result of surgical complication, there was 4% mortality, and there was major morbidity in another 18%. One of the reasons for morbidity was that this graft which was placed inside was expected to form the biological demand of causing a fusion between these two vertebra. And it was also supposed to look at the biomechanical demand of a stable anterior column. And this did not happen in many patients. So in 1989, from the Madras Medical College, we reported that the incidence of graft failure in modified Hong Kong surgery was 41%. And it was as high as 85% when the length of the graft exceeded two disc spaces. Now, this was a very unstable segment. And when you just pegged in your grafts, they either broke or they slipped. And when it slipped, the results of surgery were very, very inferior. But people were very hesitant to use instrumentation and we owe a lot to Oga and his team where they proved that the use of metals and especially titanium implants are very safe to be used even in the active stage of spinal tuberculosis. So there are many other uh, basic science work which has come and proved that the biofilm formation of mycobacterium tuberculosis is much, much less in staphyl than pyogenic uh, infection, and so it can be used. Now, we have gone much further, and we use uh, implants even in the presence of staphylococcus. So tuberculosis, you should use, you should not hesitate to use uh, implant if it is needed to give stability. A good example, here you can see a six-year-old girl, multiple vertebral bodies involved, spinal tris sign positive, and you have seen that there is a good fusion, complete debridement has taken place, bone graft has been kept over here, but the bone graft is protected and supported by a posterior instrumentation. And you can find here that this gave very good results. But in 1998, till the end of 1990s, we were a little bit worried to use a metal on the anterior side where there was active spinal tuberculosis. So that has gone much uh, better and now we don't hesitate to not only use implants posteriorly, but also use implants anteriorly, where you can see that this large defect has been made good by an anterior titanium cage. And this is very safe and it has given excellent results. But there is a major problem with the surgery because mortality and morbidity of anterior approaches is a big challenge in spinal tuberculosis. Take for example this patient. 
Now, this is a young patient, a child. A very gross kyphosis at the thoracic region. You can see that the child is respiratory compromised even before surgery. And to do an anterior approach, a thoracotomy in this child, and to do a major surgical procedure, will surely jeopardize this child, and there is a high chance that this child will be in the intensive care for many, many days with four to eight percent of mortality. So this is a problem. Secondly, we know in most of these patients with very gross kyphosis, the lungs are already compromised. The last thing you require in these patients is to do an anterior surgery, remove two ribs, and then these patients go down on a plummeting scale in the post-operative period. The third problem with the anterior approach is when you have massive kyphosis, when you come anteriorly, you are first hitting the bone here, and then the spinal cord is always hidden from your view. And when you excise these bones and when you do a debridement, you will find that the chances of your neurological deficit is very, very high. Many of these patients have slipped over. I mean, they are not one on each other, but having slipped, which means that at the apex, the spinal cord is going uh, through a tenuous course. And the chances of neurological deficit when you come anterior is very high. Now, this paper actually shows with your anterior approach that complications occur in 31% of patients and most of these complications are often pulmonary. But this is specifically important in spinal tuberculosis because many of these patients can have pulmonary lesions and to do uh, surgery anteriorly is at a risk. So slowly the concepts changed. People no longer believed that anterior pathology must be approached anteriorly. And currently the thought process is, now that we have good facility to stabilize everything from posterior side, and we can have a good purchase of both the superior and the inferior column through your pedicle screws, is it possible that we can keep the entire surgery posterior? Through the posterior side, you come and you excise the mass or do a good debridement, and then you can see here, this is the uh, surgical site. You can have a good stabilization. You go a debridement. You can remove one of the facets over here. You have a full access to the anterior column of the surgery. And once you have done a thorough debridement, you can place a cage over here for anterior reconstruction. And then shorten your posterior column to give a normal spine. This is what has been done in this patient. You can see all of this done from the posterior side. Another example over here, uh, upper thoracic curve, gross deformity of more than 70 degrees, all done from posterior side. You take good purchase. You go on a bilateral costal transosectomy approach. You do a good debridement and recreate the anterior column with a titanium cage and then have a posterior fixation done. Now this has completely improved the results. Now we agree and believe that the front door to the spine in spinal tuberculosis is actually to the, through the back. But when you do this posterior only approach, you need to be careful about one more concept and understand the difference that is there in the kyphosis of all other pathology compared to spinal tuberculosis. Now, this is a gross kyphosis due to ankylosing spondylitis. But you will find that there is no loss of vertebral body anterior. Both the anterior column and the posterior column are intact here. Comparatively, in spinal tuberculosis, you will find that they are always angular kyphosis. There is a gross destruction of the anterior column with the uh, preservation of the posterior column. Now, when you remove a small wedge over here, we have to remember that we are removing the wedge which is representing more than two or three vertebrae. 
For example, this fusion mass represents T11, T12, and the L1. The whole of the three vertebrae. And when you remove this mass, and then you bring the anterior cord. If you stretch it, then it stretches the spinal cord. But if you decide to do a posterior closing, for example, you remove this wedge, which actually represents more than two vertebrae, and then you do a posterior closing osteotomy, you will find or it can actually herniate through your laminectomy defect. And we know that this can cause a problem for neurological deficit. Now, the work of uh, these Japanese people, uh, Kawahara, you can see that when you shorten the spinal column, when you shorten it more than 20 millimeters, the anterior spinal artery completely buckles and stops. And this can end up in a gross neurological deficit. So what is important when you do a correction of the kyphosis and spinal tuberculosis is that you should not only shorten posteriorly, but also open it up anteriorly so that the spinal column cord does not get kinked. So this is called the posterior closing and anterior opening osteotomy, all done from anterior side, posterior side, and this has revolutionized the treatment of spinal tuberculosis. Now here you can see that there is a gross kyphosis over here and another patient with still grosser kyphosis. In these patients, you have to be very, very careful about uh, positioning because whenever you have a gross kyphosis, you will find that the compensatory curve involves the cervical thoracic region and it involves gross extension of the cervical spine when you position. You must be careful to avoid all this. Be careful because they are prolonged surgeries, the eyes must be padded and everything. And once you are exposed and you have put in your pedicle screws, you expose the entire length of the spinal cord so that it is always under your vision. And then you actually go and burn and remove that triangle piece of bone heavy. It is always very important that you maintain a thin layer of bone at the head so that this thin layer of bone acts as a protection for the cord. Once you have removed the wedge, you can see that the two columns have become completely separate. Now, once this has become separate, you can see you do it on the side and now you can see that the two columns are completely removed. Now, once you have done it, you can go on to the next step where you can see in some of these gross kyphosis, you will find that there is a big arch. You remove this whole column and then as the last piece, you remove the final piece of bone here. If you start removing the wedge right from the posterior side, you will find that there is a lot of epidural bleeding, number one. Second, the cord is constantly falling down. As you remove the bone, the cord will come down. And when you are using a bar or sharp instruments, you will find that your chances for a neurological deficit is very, very high. So always preserve this bone here. You remove this entire wedge, and as the last piece, you remove that vertebral bone. So once you have removed the whole wedge over here, you now take an appropriate cage, fill it up with uh, bone graft, and then after you have removed this, you can uh, make sure that there is no compression of the lamina here. There is no compression on the cord on the lamina here. And you place an appropriate sized uh, cage over here and push it to the appropriate position. And then you can use this cage as a fulcrum on which you will close the whole vertebra and then reduce the kyphosis. After that, you can use an additional procedure of shortening the posterior column and the rod, and then you can find at the end result, yeah, gross kyphosis like this can get a very good uh, correction. 
We published the initial uh, results of the 17 patients in 2010, where there was an excellent correction possible by the single stage, posterior, uh, all posterior, uh, closing, opening by osteotomy. And uh, you can get excellent results. So you can see uh, gross uh, improvement in these. And so the current thinking is that the front door to the spine is through the back. So in spinal tuberculosis, till the early 2000s, almost 95% of my surgery was through the front. And then it changed. And from 2007 or 2008, in the last 10 years, almost 98% of our surgery, whether it is active spinal tuberculosis or a healed spinal tuberculosis, with deformity or without deformity, or in any region of the spine, uh, the surgical approach for us is all posterior approach. So these are all some of the important uh, conceptual changes that have happened over some time. So to summarize, Sir Percival Portenau, where are we? Now on a simpler glance, overall, it would appear that we have come a lot and conquered the disease. But actually from the sanatorium to this, what we have actually done, or what we have been very successful, is that we are able to achieve a high level of success in individual cases. And we are bringing in new technology to optimize our results and to improve outcome. Now you can see this patient, she's actually a doctor. You can find that the odontite is completely eaten up by spinal tuberculosis. There is a large abscess with increase in the anterior spinal soft tissue over here. And normally this would have required a massive fusion, an occipital cervical fusion, but we use navigation. Even in the destroyed C2 bone, we are able to place your screws very accurately in whatever bone has been left behind. We can do a segmental fusion so that you avoid a major fusion and give them excellent results. So individual cases, we are able to do lots. But we still have a long way to go to understand about the disease. Now, in this patient, you can find that there is a small amount of cold abscess. Why do some patients have cold abscess? Why do some patients have a lot of granulation tissue? And why others do not have? Now, in this patient, you can find that the amount of bony destruction is very little. But you can find there are litters of pus on both sides. It's flowing all over. And actually, it is flowing on the backside also. And the patient has got a huge collection of cold abscess on the posterior side. So why do some patients have this? And why do some patients have a dry spinal tuberculosis without any cold abscess? We do not know. Now, many of these clinical presentations we have not understood. Now, we can also see here that we have failed a lot in our disease control. For all the advances in surgical techniques, we are still at the losing end of the battle against the disease. Spinal tuberculosis is still very common. We see the same number of cases or more in the last five years. And we have also found that no longer the dictum that spinal tuberculosis affects people who have poor nutrition or in the lower end of society is common. We get a lot of sophisticated patients. We get a lot of doctors in whom the disease spreads a lot without any pain. Why do some people have inflammatory signs positive? Why do some patients have all the red flag signs positive of a tuberculosis infection? And why in some people there is a high progression of the disease without any of these? We still do not know. We also do not know the complexity of multidrug resistant disease. And in India and China, we actually constitute more than 50% of all the MDR spinal tuberculosis. And this is going to be a big problem because this is what is going to actually destroy the patient.
So the conquest of TB cannot also happen without improvement in the socio-economic conditions. Because the, all the efforts of the government to curtail the disease by producing a vaccine has not succeeded. So unless we improve the socio-economic condition and nutrition of the society, and this is a far asking in many of the developing nations for us. So rather than just on producing newer techniques of surgery and trying to bring in newer type of implants, I think we need to look at more on the social side, on how to prevent overcrowding, on how to bring new tuberculosis vaccines, and how to bring new strategy which will cut tight to this. Now we all know that it was a huge worldwide effort that said a goodbye to polio possible. Now we should look at larger things, not just looking at how to treat a single patient, but looking at how to raise our arms against the disease itself in total. And that will actually make it possible for us to treat the disease without such. Now, Sir Reginald Watson Jones, you know, he's the author of the famous book, Watson Jones, very popular. He gave a Huntingtonian lecture in 1959. And the topic of his lecture was very interestingly, surgery is destined to the practice of medicine. And in that he said every orthopedic surgeon should not be so much interested on how to operate on the patient or how to find new methods of surgery. But he actually said, that we should actually be concentrating on how to prevent the surgery and how to overcome the disease so that surgery will become unnecessary. I think this is very, very true for spinal tuberculosis. All the different techniques in spinal tuberculosis surgery that I was alluding to previously in this lecture is actually will become unnecessary if we can be successful in trying to get a good vaccine if we can try to find newer methods of uh, diagnosis even before bone destruction takes place and we bring about good drugs which will overcome the MDR tuberculosis. So thank you very much uh, Ashok and thanks to every all of you who have been listening to this and thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much sir.